Well, what a privilege to be joined today by Perry Marshall and Dennis Noble, both of whom have interests and expertise in the area of biology, information systems, and really where we sit at the moment when it comes to evolution, genetics, and the way in which we have developed the diversity of life that we see on Earth. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, Perry, let's start with you. We go back some way. Just remind us briefly how you got interested in this whole area. I went to China to see my brother, who was a missionary 20 years ago, and uh, he said, I don't believe this stuff anymore. I'm moving back home in a month or two, and I don't consider myself a Christian. And it got us into an argument. And I said, Brian, look at the hand at the end of your arm. This is a nice piece of engineering. I'm an engineer. I should know. And he pushed right back with a very standard mutation, natural selection kind of an argument. And I'd never really had that argument before. And I, I thought, well, I've never learned a single thing in my entire engineering career that would support what he just said. That doesn't make any sense. But I also thought there's a lot of things in science that are very counterintuitive. And rather than arguing with him, I'm going to just stop and I'm going to go home and I'm going to figure this out because he was pushing my buttons really hard too. We'd already been having this conversation for a while. And so I said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to hit the books. I'm going to read the scientific papers, whatever I got to do. And I'm going to figure out does it really make sense that just billiard balls banging around in the universe and natural selection would explain, you're, you're going to have to explain this to an engineer who can read a science paper. And so I went down that rabbit hole and I discovered an incredible array of things that I couldn't have even imagined, including Dennis Noble and people that have worked with him over the years. Lynn Margulis, who worked with Dennis for a long time, and I formed a completely different picture of biology than I ever had growing up as a creationist, and certainly very different than the selfish gene kind of thing that was being preached everywhere in the world at the time, and and it's turned into a second career, so <laughs> here we are today. Here, here we are indeed. Dennis, um, perhaps just give a very potted history of, of your uh, background as a scientist, your research interests, and uh, what's drawn you into partnering with Perry in researching these issues? Well, I started as um, a scientist interested in a very practical question, the heart rhythm, the beating of the heart, was in 1960, when I was a research student at University College London, one of the biggest open questions still in physiology, how does a set of molecules generate that nice once per second, roughly, rhythm? And I was allocated to do work with a physiologist called Otto Hutter, who was working on the heart, and quite rapidly in the course of that work, we found two membrane proteins, that's, they're called channels, that carry potassium. Those are ions, charged atoms. And I wondered then, could it be that the characterization of those proteins would enable me to understand the generation of the rhythm? which took me into some very deep mathematical modeling work. Now, my supervisor was completely outside the area of mathematics in biology, so he said to me, Dennis, you're on your own. I pleaded with the people who used a very big um, uh, machine, a computer, a valve computer in those days, um, to let me have time on the machine because I worked out with a hand calculator it would take years to do the relevant calculations. I succeeded and six months later I had a paper in Nature, a uh, sole author paper, before I even got my thesis. And 
that started a process which 30 years later, now fast forwarding to about 1990, we realized was only half the story. Yes, I had succeeded in working out what generated the heart rhythm, but I'd only found maybe a quarter of the total story because we found that any one of those proteins could be knocked out and the rhythm would still continue. That meant, and that's what we discovered, that there are other processes that come in, and this introduced me to a very general property of biological systems. They are fail-safe. That, incidentally, explains why the gene-centric genome sequencing project has been such a tragic and catastrophic failure for us. Um, that's been announced very recently from a study at University College London, where I was studying 60-odd years ago, um, showing that if you subject the predictions from the genetics, the genome sequencing, to possible disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, the two big ones, nervous diseases, yet another great big area um, of diseases, the answer is zilch. Subject that information to the same criteria as for clinical trial of a new drug, and you get a failure of prediction. Now, I realized when I retired in 2004, so just 20 years ago, that this was big. This is the reason why gene-centric biology is actually nonsense, and it's now being proven to be nonsense. You don't have genes for this, genes for that, except in a very few rare genetic diseases affecting about 5% of the population. So I thought it's time to say, hey, wait a minute, we've actually got biology backwards. We think genes created us, body and mind, that's to quote Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene, but they don't. It's the other way round. We are the controllers of what our proteins and the genes that enable them to be made do. It's very simple. It's like asking the question, is the music, the notes on the sheet of paper that Schubert wrote his uh, composition on? No, it isn't until somebody plays it. And that's the key. The act of playing is us as organisms, which means even more relevant to your program that purpose in biology is back because what gives purpose in biology, it's us. It's us as creative individuals. Now, that's a very strange story going all the way from being a very reductionist, if you like, scientist working out heart rhythm to then coming out 40 years later to say, wait a minute, this is big. And it means that in biology, we've got the evolution story and the gene-centric story completely wrong. There's a potted history of what happened to me. It's it's an excellent potted history. Thank you very much, and I, I, I appreciated the analogy you used there at the end for those of us who aren't scientists to get our heads around it.